Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Basili, your orthopedics faculty with Marrow. Uh, we are going to discuss the November INI set 2022 MCQ recalls uh, based on the exam. Now this was a unique exam because it had two sessions, the morning and the evening session. But uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the kind of questions that were asked were almost from the similar topics. There were roughly around seven questions each in the morning and evening session. And the topic overlap was humongous. So there was a lot of repeat questions in both the sessions with slight variations. But before I begin, let me tell you that this is a recall based exam a question. Uh, now, what do you mean by recall? Recall means students recollect the question and they tell us and then we uh, try to, uh, you know, replicate the exact questions. But uh, it cannot be the exact question that must have showed up on the exam. There might be a slight change of the language here and there because of which the answer may change. Nevertheless, the aim here is not to know the right answer because the exact answer nobody knows and whatever it is, you have already done with it. The point here is to understand what the examiner is basically testing so that we are aware of what it can ask again in the future so that we are never caught off guard. All right. With that said, we will discuss the question and see what the question in the examiner is trying to ask and try to analyze. Fortunately for you, if you've been following my videos and watching the revision videos as well, most of the things were already discussed in the class and the videos. So with that said, let's begin the November 2022 INI set recall session number one. Now in session one, the morning session, there were roughly seven questions from orthopedics. Uh, they were divided in spine, nerve and trauma and nerve injuries had overlap and we had two questions coming from that. We had a test, Tendelenburg test question that was asked again in the evening session as well. We had one question uh, from tumors and no points in guessing which tumor it was. Yes giant cell tumor, and one question from pediatric orthopedics, both in morning and evening session. So these were the seven questions that were asked in the morning session. So let's look at the first question. Now, a 65-year-old postmenopausal female came with persistent backache, not responding to conservative treatment. Now, the history, now there is a history of lifting heavy weights four months back with progressively increasing pain that worsens on walking. Right. The pain starts radiating down her legs after walking for around 100 meter distance. She, however, feels no pain on climbing up the stairs. What is the most probable diagnosis? Right Now, she, she has pain on walking and the pain starts roughly around 100 meters of walking. The pain has been progressive, gradual. But the interesting thing here is that she does not have pain while climbing up the stairs. The options are osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture, lumbar canal stenosis, atherosclerosis, or Boeger's disease or thromboangitis obliterans. Right. What do you think is the answer? Pause the video and try to think. Now, the correct answer for this question is actually lumbar canal stenosis. What is this lumbar canal stenosis? You must have heard of prolapsed intervertebral disc. Right. What happens there? The disc prolapses out posteriorly and it compresses the neural elements. Right. What is this lumbar canal stenosis? It is the stenosis of the lumbar canal through which the spinal neural elements pass. Right. The spinal cord and the spinal nerves. This canal is known as the lumbar canal or the spinal canal. This canal becomes stenosed. Do you know why? This is the thing. In elderly people, the intervertebral disc loses its elasticity, its charm, its, its youth. And because of that, it becomes degenerated and desiccated. Now, when the disc becomes degenerated and desiccated, the spine loses the stability and hence become unstable. Now, when the spine becomes unstable, the facet joints keep on moving. And when they keep on moving, there is a damage to the facet joint leading to osteophyte formation. Now, that these osteophytes that are formed are basically bony growths that are formed to stabilize this unstable spine. Now, the problem is, as these bony growths form, they occupy the space that was supposed to be occupied by the neural elements. And this narrows down the spinal canal. And this leads to its stenosis. This is lumbar canal stenosis. So, what is the story here? Elderly patient. Disc becomes degenerated. Spine becomes unstable, facet joints get damaged and osteophytes form and these osteophytes that form, these new bones that form, they stenose or decrease the space in the lumbar canal or the spinal canal, compressing the neural elements. So this is kind of a condition which gives you neurogenic claudication. 
So it's usually seen in elderly people and the patient complains of pain, particularly after walking a certain distance in an erect posture. And what happens after that? After that, he stops and he starts bending forward. You see, when you bend forward, when your spine bends forward, you basically increase the space in the lumbar canal. And when your spine goes into extension, you narrow the space. As it is, the space is narrowed. And if you're standing upright or bending forward, the space, become, the space becomes further narrowed and the pain increases. So this elderly gentleman bends forward. On bending forward, the space opens up the pain decreases. You see, when he bends forward, the pain decreases. On sitting down also, the pain decreases. Once the pain decreases, he gets up and he walks again. This is a classical presentation of a neurogenic claudication. So pain versus on extension or standing upright or bending backwards, but pain is relieved on flexion, that is sitting or leaning forward. This has been characteristically described as a shopping cart position, right? Shopping cart position. So elderly patient, Standing upright, complains of pain, but bending forward, pain is relieved. As in leaning on the shopping cart, the pain decreases. So if you look at the question, it clearly tells you that there is pain on walking after a certain distance, say 100 meters, but the pain decreases on climbing up the stairs. Now what happens when you climb up the stairs? As you're climbing up the stairs, you will notice that your spine is actually bending forward and that is how you climb up the stairs, right? You climb up the stairs, your spine actually bends forward. So it's in flexion. And when your spine goes into flexion, the space opens up and the pain decreases, right? So do you understand this? And this is a very important distinction uh, between neurogenic and vascular claudication. See, both of these patients have pain on walking a certain distance. But the key difference here is that the pain increases when you're walking in both the conditions, neurogenic as well as vascular claudication. And pain is relieved on sitting in both the conditions. The pain is relieved on sitting in both the conditions, neurogenic as well as vascular claudication. Now, the interesting difference of pain is that vascular claudication, pain is more peripheral. That starts in the calf, the calf muscles. Whereas neurogenic uh, claudication, the pain starts in the back. Another important thing is there is a postural difference. Neurogenic claudication patient bends forward or flexes the spine to reduce the pain. Whereas a vascular claudication patient has no difference in terms of posture. No difference in terms of posture, right? So there is a postural change in neurogenic claudication and no postural change in vascular claudication. Now, once walking, there is pain, right? So the patient stops. On stopping, if the patient remains erect and the spine is in extension, the pain will not decrease in neurogenic claudication because the spine is in extension. Whereas in vascular claudication, the moment the patient stops, the metabolic demand of the muscle stops, so ischemia decreases, pain decreases, right? So relieves of symptoms on standing stationary. So standing stationary in erect posture will not decrease the pain in neurogenic claudication, whereas it decreases in vascular claudication. For the person of neurogenic claudication to decrease the pain, he needs to bend forward. Now about climbing up the stairs, as I told you, as you climb up the stairs, you actually flex your spine. So the pain decreases in a patient with a neurogenic claudication, whereas in vascular claudication, there is no change. There is still pain because it's still moving the muscle and the muscle demands oxygen, but it is decreased because of vascular ischemia. Are you following? So any kind of activity causes pain in vascular claudication, but on flexion, if there is activity, there is no pain in neurogenic claudication. Are you following? Are you following? And last thing, which is the most obvious thing, in vascular claudication, the patient will have some abnormality in pulses because it's a vascular problem, right? So you've understood it is neurogenic claudication. Now, one last thing I want you to understand is intervertebral disc prolapse versus lumbar canal stenosis. This I want you to understand. If you recall, intervertebral disc prolapse is basically the herniation of the intervertebral disc to posteriorly compressing the neural elements. Whereas lumbar canal stenosis is basically the facet hypertrophy or the osteophytes that are formed in the spine in elderly patient that decreases or stenosis the spinal canal. Now, both of them cause compression of the neural elements, but their uh, presentation is different. You see, PIVD usually occurs in young individuals, whereas lumbar canal stenosis occurs in elderly people. And in PIVD, remember, it's usually an acute onset thing, something that happened following lifting of heavy object uh, by a, a bodybuilder in the gym. He has lifted a heavy object or abnormal posturing or lifting a heavy carton or crate. Whereas lumbar canal stenosis is something that happens progressively over the months in an elderly patient. Now, 
The interesting thing is in prolapsed intervertebral disc, the pain increases on bending forward and leaving, uh, lifting a heavy object. That is, pain increases on flexion. Whereas in lumbar canal stenosis, I've told you that the pain decreases on flexion. So the key points to keep in your mind is elderly patient, pain decreasing on flexion is lumbar canal stenosis. So the question's answer is lumbar canal stenosis. Now, question number two, a relatively easy question. Book test is used to assess the function of adductor pollicis. All right. Which of the following nerve supplies the muscle? So it's essentially an anatomy come orthopedic question. So adductor pollicis, book test, which nerve are we talking about? Yes, the correct answer is ulnar nerve. And I'm sure all of you must have gotten it right. Ulnar nerve uh, supplies the adductor, that is a thenar muscle. The only thenar muscle it supplies is adductor pollicis, whose action is to adduct the thumb. And you can test for it by book test, where you ask the patient to hold the book between the thumb and the index finger uh, by adducting the thumb. If there is an ulnar nerve injury or a palsy, adductor, pal adductor pollicis will become weak. And the patient will be unable to hold the book. Now, if you start pulling the book out, the book will start to slip from the patient's grip. And so the patient will feel that he's failing the test. And in order to prevent his failure, he will try to hold the book tightly. And the only way he can do it is by flexing the thumb using his flexor pollicis longus. Now, the moment he uses his flexor pollicis longus, his thumb goes into flexion. This is what is known as a froment sign. And the test is book test, right? So straightforward, obvious answer. All of you must have gotten it right. Now friends, the next question is, a six-year-old boy, a sustained fracture of the lateral condyle of the humerus, a gradually developed elbow deformity, which of the following are the likely outcomes? This is kind of a repeat question asked from the previous INI set as well. What, is the, what do you think is the answer? Yes, the correct answer is inability to adduct the fingers. Right now, you have to understand what this examiner is asking you. He's telling you that there is a patient who had a lateral condyle humerus fracture. Right, lateral condyle humerus fracture gradually develops an elbow deformity. So lateral condyle humerus fracture will give you which kind of deformity? The lateral condyle does not grow. So there is medial condyle that grows beyond the normal capacity. So there is cubitus valgus deformity, right? And cubitus valgus deformity over time will give you tardy ulnar nerve palsy. So ulnar nerve palsy will happen. So the question asking about ulnar nerve. So ulnar nerve palsy, what will be the manifestation? A hand deformity? No, that is median nerve. Pointing index? Median nerve, kilo nevin sign, anterior interosseous nerve. So the best answer here is inability to adduct the fingers. Because which muscle adduct the fingers? The palmar interosse, which is supplied by ulnar nerve. So if you quickly recall, uh, this is your lateral condyle of the humerus fracture. This question has been asked multiple times, either as an image-based question, in terms of complication, in terms of Salter and Harris fracture. So many things. This is an intra-articular fracture. This is a type 4 Salter and Harris fracture. Right? You can clearly see that this happens. Type 4 Salter Harris fracture. It's an intra-articular fracture, fracture of necessity. Three-point bony relationship of the elbow is disturbed. Now, I told you since the growth plate is involved, the lateral condyle ceases to grow and there is growth of the medial condyle, which eventually causes the deformity. Which deformity is that? Cubitus valgus deformity. And in cubitus valgus deformity, over time as the Valgus deformity keeps on increasing. The soft tissue structures over the medial side, particularly behind the medial epicondyle, that is the ulnar nerve, gets stretched over time. And once it gets stretched, there is ulnar nerve palsy. So the patient will complain of paresthesia, tingling and numbness in the ulnar distribution, that is the medial one and a half fingers and all the muscles that are supplied by ulnar nerve. So this is your tardy ulnar nerve palsy occurs because of cubitus valgus deformity that occurs because of non-union of lateral condyle of humerus fracture. Now the next question is, a patient had difficulty climbing upstairs. When he was made to bear weight on the right lower limb, the pelvis of the left side dropped down, which is the structure involved causing the problem. Again, this is a repeat question. The question is basically asking you about Trendelenburg test. Right. So what is it telling you here? The patient had difficulty climbing up the stairs. All right. Now, when he's made to bear weight on the right lower limb, so when he's starting on the right lower limb, the left side drops down. So if you remember, I taught you in the class that the sound side sinks. So which side is sinking here? The left side is sinking. That is the sound side. That is the healthy side. So which is the pathological side? The right side is the pathological side. And what are the components of the Trendelenburg unit? It is the abductors and the nerve that supplies those abductors. Principal abductors are gluteus, medius, and minimus. 
and the nerve supplying them is superior gluteal nerve. So right superior gluteal nerve would be the one that is causing this problem. So the correct answer here is right superior gluteal nerve. So my friends, if you do not know this, let me just quickly recall this for you. Whenever a patient stands on one limb, the abductors of that limb bring the opposite pelvis up to help the patient in walking, right? So if the patient is standing on this limb, these abductors, abductors bring this opposite pelvis up. But if there is a failure, if there is a failure of the abductor mechanism, either a gluteus medius or minimus palsy or superior gluteal nerve palsy of that side, what happens? The opposite side or the healthy side sinks down. Now, there are two things that you need to understand. The sound side sinks, that is the first thing. And when the patient is standing on the pathological side, you call that side to be Trendelenburg positive. Right? So if a patient is standing on the right side and the left side is sinking down, so the sound side is sinking, so the healthy side is left. So which is the pathological side? Right side. So when he's standing on the right side, it's called right side Trendelenburg positive, which leads to left side sinking down. Is that clear? So I've put this in words over here. Trendelenburg test is basically to assess the abduction of the hip. The abductors are medius and minimus, which are supplied by superior gluteal nerve. So on nerve or muscle damage, what happens? Patient will, will be unable to abduct. So unable to tilt the pelvis back to neutral. So there will be sinking of the sound side or the healthy side, right? So if he's standing on the affected side, that's the right side, the left side tilts down. The sound side will sink down. Is that clear? This question has been asked multiple times on your exam, either in terms of the muscle or in terms of the nerve. Now, this is a spotter question. Name the nerve that is likely injured in the following fracture. So you need to identify the fracture and based on that, you should know which nerve is affected. So this is the femur, this is the tibia, this is the fibula. There looks like to be a fracture here on the neck of the fibula. Which nerve do you think will be injured in such a fracture? Yes, the correct answer is common peroneal nerve. Again, an anatomy come uh, nerve injury question. So if you recall, common peroneal nerve wraps around the neck of the fibula and then divides into a superficial and a deep branch. Deep branch supplies the uh, dorsal dorsiflexors of the ankle and the superficial branch uh, supplies the everters of the ankle. And because of which there will be a, a foot drop where the patient will be unable to ankle dorsiflex and evert. So there will be a plantar flexion of the anchor that is your common peroneal nerve injury and the splint that you use in foot drop is toe raising or foot drop splint now one more thing about neck of fibula fracture that i want you to know for future reference is something known as a mesonaves fracture here what happens is there is a, a twisting injury to the ankle because of which there is a medial malleolus fracture and the force of the fracture passes through the introsious membrane goes proximally up to the neck of fibula as well so there are two things that you will notice here there is a neck of fibula fracture as well as ankle instability or medial malleolus fracture and the energy is transmitted through the interosseous membrane and there is a tear of the interosseous membrane as well. So that is what a mesonave fracture is. So if you get an x-ray of a fracture of the neck of the fibula, always try to look at the ankle as well because you might never know that there can be an ankle instability or medial malleolus fracture also because this is a fracture that can occur in combination as well. Just keep this at the back of your mind. This question is yet to be asked. Okay, let's look at this question. It's a multiple correct answer type. Which of the following is incorrect about the lesion shown in the image? So this is a spotter based question, which means that you cannot answer the question without understanding what the image is all about. So let's see the image. There's an image here uh, of the wrist looks like an adult or a child adult yeah skeletally mature very good and there is a lesion here at the distal of the radius in the epiphysis and involving part of metaphysis soap bubble sort of a lesion right what do you think it is absolutely you're right this is giant cell tumor classical location of giant cell tumor right now we know that it's giant cell tumor so the question is asking about the incorrect statement of giant cell tumor 30 percent malignant transformation Mm, yes, it does transform, but not so much. That looks like it's a false statement. Epiphyseal, yes, this is true. Ground glass opacity is diagnostic. Is it diagnostic? Radiological finding, can it be diagnostic for a tumor? No. The best investigation to make the diagnosis of any tumor is basically biopsy. So that doesn't look like a correct statement. Can occur in metaphysis in children? Yes, it can occur in metaphysis in children, although it is epiphyseal, right? Most commonly occurs in ages of 40 to 60 years. 
No, it usually most commonly occurs in ages 20 to 40 years, but can occur in elderly patients also. But most commonly, it does not occur in 40 to 60. So the three wrong statements are A, C and E. Now, the, the statements may be slightly different. That must have shown on the exam. But nevertheless, these are the points that you should know. First, quickly, whatever you know about giant cell tumor is that it's very locally aggressive. Epiphyseo metaphyseal, more common in females and the usual age group is 20 to 40 years. That is after skeletal maturity. We know this. Now, the most common location of giant cell tumor is around the knee. That is distal femur followed by proximal tibia. And the third most common location is the distal end of the radius. But, but, but. The most common tumor that occurs at the distal end of the radius is a giant cell tumor, right? So the most common location of giant cell tumor is distal femur. Second is proximal tibia. Third is distal radius. But the most common tumor that occurs at the distal of the radius is giant cell tumor. So the most common tumor occurring at the distal end of the radius is a giant cell tumor, right? Clinically, eggshell crackling, we know that. Soap bubble appearance on x-ray, you also know that. Now, some new important points that you should know are that local recurrence occurs in 20% of the cases. But even after you have surgically removed the lesion, there is a chance of recurrence in 20% of the cases. Less than 5% of the cases have a risk of malignant transformation. So, very less, less than 5, less than 5%. And if it becomes malignant, which malignant tumor will it become? Secondary osteosarcoma is one, fibrosarcoma is two, and pleomorphic sarcoma or a malignant fibrous histiocytoma. Is the third. So these three malignant tumors it can transform into. It can metastasize to lungs in three or less than three percent of the patients, right? Please remember that. In less than three percent of the patients, it can metastasize to lungs. Now, metastases are more common for GCTs that occur at the distal radius lesions rather than the GCTs that occur around the knee. Right. These are few facts that you should know that are uh, new facts that you must have not known about giant cell tumor before because this is one of those tumors that keep showing up again and again on your exam. Right? Please understand this. Now, if you remember, what is the treatment of giant cell tumor and aneurysmal bone cyst? It is extensive or extended curatage where you remove the lesion and you make sure you kill um, the cells in the, uh, the cavity so that the chances of recurrence are minimal. Right? So what do you use to extend the curatage? You can use phenol, liquid nitrogen, or you can use high-speed bursts. These are used to reduce the recurrence rates. Now, now, one interesting thing that you should know is about radiotherapy. The role of radiotherapy in giant cell tumor. Now, there is a role, but only indicated in operable lesions. So, only in inoperable cases, you can use a radiotherapy for giant cell tumor. Otherwise, the standard mode of treatment is extended or extensive curatage. Sacral lesions and large vertebral body lesions that are not amenable to surgery, you can go ahead and try radiotherapy. One more problem of radiotherapy is that radiotherapy increases the risk of malignant transformation of GCT. So suppose you use radiotherapy to treat the giant cell tumor, there is an increased risk now of this giant cell tumor to become malignant secondary osteosarcoma. So please keep these things in your mind. Right. So those were the few new things that you should know about a giant cell tumor in order to be prepared for the future exams. Now, the last question of the morning session was this question that was asked from pediatric orthopedics. Now, I have two variations of these questions because the words slightly change, but I don't think it matters a lot. You visit a newborn near your house. Do you really do that? Do you really go out and meet newborns? Do you visit them? You visit a newborn near your house and identify that the child has CTV. When will you advise the baby's parents to put a cast? Wow. So this is the first variation of the question. Second variation is you see a child with CTV. When will you ask the parents to seek treatment or the first cast application? So basically the question is asking, when will you first apply the cast in a CTV baby? Or when will you first go ahead and do the treatment of the CTV baby? Right? That is what it is asking. So one year of age, uh, three months of age, two weeks of age, when the child starts walking. So I've told you this, I've taught you this in the class. When the child starts walking, it's too late, right? It's one year. We don't do that. So one year and one year doesn't matter. Three months or two weeks, when would you go? See, the best answer would be as early as possible, but not more than two weeks, right? That's what I've taught you in class, but not more than two weeks. As early as possible is the best answer. But since it's not given in the options, or if it were given in the options, you would have chosen that. Here we will choose two weeks of age.
right so if you want to quickly recall ctv there are a few things that you should remember what is the problem of ctv there is a hypoplastic talus uh, because of which there is a talonavicular instability or dislocation which gives you an unstable foot and because of tibialis posterior and tendoachillus pull there is a deformity now what is the primary deformity of foot remember the mnemonic cave it is cavus adduction varus and equinus this is the primary deformity of ct cavus means exaggeration of the medial longitudinal arch adduction means forefoot goes into adduction varus is basically inversion and equinus is plantar flexion deformity right so there is cavus there is adduction there is varus and there is equinus deformity this is the deformity so remember the mnemonic cave now the question arises when will you go for the treatment now the treatment i've told you best is as early as possible that is the ponsetti's technique but but before ponsetti described his technique the world used to follow a technique known as kite's method now in kite's method the treatment would be initiated after around 3 months of age so you would wait for 3 months and then you would initiate the treatment and the treatment would just be to connect the deformity and hold that correction with the help of a cast till the foot grows and then the deformity stops growing right that was the aim of the treatment now ponsetti said that waiting 2 month waiting 3 months is too late he said let's start the treatment as soon as possible ideally by the time the umbilical cord falls off the treatment should be started so that's roughly around 2 months now the correction of the deformity was same in uh, both the uh, methods you have to correct cave so you have to correct cavus adduction varus and equinus the problem with kite's method was it, it took four steps to correct the deformity cavus then adduction then varus and then equinus so inversion is also known as varus so don't get confused next right. so it took four steps to correct the deformity kite wrapped this up in three steps he said let's correct cavus first adduction and varus together and in the third step we will correct the equinus okay right that was the uh, the difference between kites and ponsetti's technique so the points to remember are the best technique that we use to correct ctv is the ponsetti's technique and here the treatment should be started as soon as possible or at least by the time the umbilical cord falls off that's roughly around 2 weeks and you manipulate the foot and correct the deformity in three steps first you correct cavus then adduction varus and then equinus and once you've corrected the foot you apply the cast that goes above the knee and keep the cast for one week time and you repeat doing this for a period of 8 to 9 weeks around 80 to 90% of the patients will have a treatment or completely treated ctev but the problem is the treatment is incomplete you have to prevent its recurrence by using a splint and what is that splint dennis brown splint till what age of age um, you use dennis brown splint till at least 1 year of age why what happens at 1 year around that time the child starts walking and with this splint the child will be unable to walk So you give this splint when the child is sleeping, and when the child is awake and walking, you give him the CTEV shoe. Right? These are the characteristics of the CTEV shoe. In the day, when the child is walking, give him the shoe, and in the night, when the child is sleeping, you give him the Dennis Brown splint. And you use this, the combination of the splint and shoe, for at least five years of age, and that's the treatment that is completed for prevention of CTEV. right so that is how you completely treat a ctv child so quick recap 0 to 1 year if the child presents to you on time early you do the ponsetti's serial manipulation and casting change the cast every one week the cast have to go has to go above the knee and usually by 8 to 9 weeks the deformity is corrected once corrected use the dennis brown splint till 1 year of age after that the child starts walking so use the dennis brown splint in the night when the child is sleeping and the ctv shoe in the day when he's walking till around 5 years of age and that completes the treatment now these are the different treatments for different age groups but remember this one also if the child presents to you after 10 years of age the correction of the deformity becomes very very difficult because the bone has grown the soft tissue has contracted so you will fuse the foot in whatever deformed position it is so fusion of the joint is known as arthrodesis so you fuse three joints that is triple arthrodesis so what are those three joints quickly tell me talonavicular talo calcaneal and calcaneo cuboid and the most important joint is the talo navicular joint so that completes the uh, treatment of ctv now let's look at the second session questions again we had roughly around 7 questions in the evening session again one question from tendelenburg 
Trauma, open fracture, a very commonly asked, frequently asked topic on your AIMS or INS8 exam. Again, no surprises. One question from nerve injuries, one question from tumors, and again, no points in guessing which tumor it would have been. It is giant cell tumor. Again, one question from pediatric orthopedics, one question from metabolic bone diseases, and one more question from sports injuries. So it took a while for AIMS exam to ask another question from sports injuries, but nevertheless, um, it has been a very commonly asked topic on your exam. So let's look at the first question. Patient standing on one side has Trendelenburg sign positive. What is the action of the muscle tested in Trendelenburg test? So abduction, flexion, adduction, internal rotation. Essentially, this is an anatomy question asking you the action of the involved muscle. So which is the involved muscle? For Trendelenburg test, it is gluteus medius and minimus, predominantly medius, right? So what is the action of gluteus medius? We know for sure it is abduction. So one has to be there. Is it only one or one and four? Now I've referred the anatomy and the best answer here is one and four. That is abduction and internal rotation. That is the action of gluteus medius, right? So straightforward, no brainer question. You should know the action of the muscle here, right? Moving on, uh, what is not required in an emergency management of an open femur fracture? So it's an open fracture. The question is asking you what is not required in an open femur fracture? Now, open reduction and internal fixation, close reduction and external fixation, antibiotic coverage, open reduction and external fixation, right? So it's an open fracture. You classify it with Gustilo Anderson's classification. And what is the management of any open fracture? You do wound management first and then go for the fracture. Wound management is debridement, removal of dead necrotic tissue, wound washing, right? And then how will you stabilize the bone? With an external fixator. You do not put anything into the bone. No internal fixation in open fracture because there is a risk of infection, right? Obviously, you should use antibiotics. So antibiotic coverage is fine. Closed reduction external fixation is fine. Open reduction external fixation is also fine. But open reduction and internal fixation, no, no. That doesn't look like the right answer because internal fixation should be avoided in open fractures because it increases the risk of infection. Right, you know this. So another variation of the same question, which students are telling me, open fracture of femur, what is the treatment? Okay, so this is a direct variation of that question. Open fracture of femur, what is the treatment? Close reduction, internal fixation, no, I've just told you. Open reduction, internal fixation, again, no internal fixation. Open reduction, external fixation, possibly. Close reduction, external fixation. Now, both of these are external fixations. Which one will you choose? Now, since the fracture is already open, you're going to visualize the reduction under your eye. So open reduction and external fixation is the most appropriate answer for this kind of a question. But I still feel this was not an accurate recall of the question. But nevertheless, this question and this theme of questioning and this topic of uh, questioning has been asked again and again on your AIMS exam. So AIMS, an INI set, is amused by external fixators and I've taught you everything about external fixation. So quickly recall, the pins that you put into the bone is Shan's pins and you connect them with a rod and this stabilizes the bone outside the body because you do not want to put anything in the bone because of risk of infection and you put these pins away from the wound, right? Now, X-ray shows you the fracture. These are the pins and recall that these are the pins, the Shan's pins, these are the connecting rods. And you use this external fixator till you can convert the open fracture into a closed fracture with the help of a skin grafting flap or wound management, vac therapy, whatever you want to. Right. Now, once you have done that, once you have converted an open fracture into closed fracture, then you can remove the external fixators and go for a, a definitive treatment. And I've also talked about uh, increasing the stability of external fixator. A very simple way to remember is if you increase the number of pins, you can make it more stable. If you increase the number of connecting rods, you can make it more stable. And if you increase the number of planes in which the rods are applied, you can increase the stability of the external fixator. So this was also a question that was asked in the previous years in INI set. So increasing the number of pins or increasing the number of rods or increasing the number of planes will increase the stability of the external fixator. And the most stable type of external fixator is the Elizarov external fixator. The other types of external fixators, this is the Elizarov ring external fixator. Other types of external fixator are rail fixator or limb reconstruction system, which also help you uh, compress and distract the fracture site because the external fixator is applied on a template of rails, which can be compressed or distracted as required. Okay. 
So external fixators, very important topic. Open fracture is a very important topic. Compartment syndrome, a very important topic for INI sector. Nerve injuries question. A feature of Klumke's palsy involving the lower trunks leads to wrist drop, ape thumb deformity, claw hand, policeman tip deformity. I'm sure all of you must have answered this correctly. The answer is claw hand because Klumke's palsy, lower roots and trunks involves the C8 T1, which is predominant part of the ulnar nerve. So it's an ulnar nerve injury, ulnar plus median nerve injury. So it gives you claw hand. Wrist drop is because of radial nerve palsy. Ape hand deformity is because of median nerve palsy. And policeman's tip deformity, yes, herbs palsy, right, herbs palsy. Another variation of this question that was asked, some students recall, is a multiple correct Walla question. The feature of Klumke's palsy involving the lower trunks lead to, so basically Klumke's palsy leads to what? Ape hand deformity, no. Claw hand, yes. Policeman tip deformity, no. Horner syndrome, yes. So the answer is B and D. So C8T1, right? C8T1 combination, that is what gives you your clumky palsy. T1, if you recall, also supplies the sympathetic supply to the ipsilateral side of the face. So when C8T1 is involved, the T1 of the ipsilateral eye will be paralyzed. So sympathetic supply to the eye will be gone. So patient will have your Horner syndrome. Right? So C8 T1 injury, clumky palsy, lower roots and trunks. T1 supplies the sympathetic supply to the eye. So ulnar claw hand or claw hand with Horner syndrome. Right? Clumky palsy, C8 T1 involved uh, manifestation is ulnar and median more than the radial manifestation. So the patient will have complete clawing with Horner's syndrome. And what is Horner syndrome? Ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis. And loss of ciliospinal reflex. So a patient with complete clawing of hand or a patient with a claw hand with difficulty in vision, inability to open the eyelid, what does he have? He has a Klumke's palsy. Okay, another spotter easy question. A 35-year-old man uh, presented with knee pain. The exit of his knee joint is given below. What is the probable diagnosis? Right. So we have an age here, 35 means skeletal maturity. And there is this is your femur and this is your tibia. And there is a lesion in the distal femur, right? involving the epiphysis and moving into the metaphysis. What do you think this is? This is an epiphysial lesion in a skeletally mature individual. So the answer here is giant cell tumor, right? So it is osteoclastoma. I'm sure all of you have got this right. So straightforward question, you should know this. It, a few more uh, variations of this image that can show up on your exam. Again, look at this. This is a femur and this is tibia. And there is a lesion here in the epiphysis of the tibia. Skeletally mature lesion in the epiphysis. Think giant cell tumor. Skeletally immature lesion in the epiphysis. What will you think? Chondroblastoma, also known as Codman's tumor. Perfect, perfect. And look at this. Femur, tibia, lesion in the epiphysis giant cell tumor and this is a lesion in the distal end of the radius epiphysis giant cell tumor so it's so classical that if they show you a tumor at the distal end of the radius the first instinct answer should be giant cell tumor but be careful if the growth plate is open or closed you see that if it is closed think of giant cell tumor very good right so in the evening session another question was first deformity corrected in ctv now you tell me whether it's kite's method or ponsetti's method of manipulation which is the first deformity that you will correct yes the correct answer is give us perfect perfect now a child comes to you with difficulty in walking labs show alp is 1322 international unit what is your likely diagnosis is it osteomalacia osteogenesis imperfecta rickets paget's disease so question says a child and there is an x-ray of a wrist of the child where you can see the cupping, splaying and widening. Now, what are the options you will safely rule out? Osteomalacia you will rule out. Paget's disease you will rule out. Two that you are left with are osteogenesis imperfecta and rickets. Now my friends tell me, osteogenesis imperfecta is a problem of the collagen or the mineral? It's a problem of the collagen, right? So why will ALP be elevated? ALP will be elevated if there is a problem of the mineral, right? The problem of the mineral. There is bone problem, mineral problem. What is it? Answer here is rickets. If you remember in rickets, what are the lab findings? The answer here is rickets. In the lab findings of rickets, the patient will have calcium that is low or normal, PTH that is high, phosphate that is low and ALP that is high. ALP that is high, right? 
this is a case of rickets clear cut x ray hai and alkaline phosphate what is the normal range of alp the normal range is 45 to 145 somewhere around that that is a normal range if it's so high it means that there is a, a mon turnover going on as in rickets right if you recall clinical findings of rickets early changes are seen in the skull craniotype is softening of the skull ping pong skull frontal bossing delayed closure of fontanelles right earliest changes in mcq what about the changes in the chest you see rickettsia rosary which are non tender and blunt whereas scorbutic rosary seen in scurvy which is sharp and tender there will be harrison sulcus pigeon chest pectus carinatum and the classical cupping splaying fraying and widening of the metaphysis is because the growth plate is growing without the calcification the growth plate is growing without getting calcified because of deficiency in calcium in patients of rickets because of deficiency of vitamin d so the hypertrophic layer keeps on growing causing this cupping splaying and widening and fraying of the joints now this is a reversible deformity the moment you start the patient on vitamin d the calcium gets absorbed and it goes to the hypertrophic layer and gets deposited and hypertrophic layer becomes a layer of calcification and becomes layer of ossification which becomes a part of the bone now the osteoclast will come and remodel and bring this deformity back to normal right so again look at this this is a patient who had rickets but now on consumption of vitamin d there is deposition of calcium and then you see this white line of frankel suggesting that the rickets is healing suggesting the rickets is healing okay and recall in osteogenesis imperfecta what will you see you will see fragile brittle bones with blue sclera with blue sclera that's a collagen even gene defect the patient will have intrauterine fractures multiple intrauterine fractures that can be picked up on antenatal scan there will be blue sclera classically that you will see in osteogenesis imperfecta the last question that was asked here was this which of the following marked structures affected in terrible triad so they are basically asking you terrible triad of the knee right so this this was the image given and these were the options given so it's a factual question you should know what is the triad or o'donohue's triad or painful triad of the knee three structures injured are mcl medial meniscus and acl right so identify where is mcl right this is mcl a medial meniscus b and acl c so the correct answer is a b see another variation of this question was a direct question terrible triad includes injury to acl alone acl and medial collateral lateral collateral ligament acl medial collateral ligament and medial meniscus so it is a triad so obviously it should be three i'm i'm sure there is a variation here that the options might have been slightly different but it was a direct question nevertheless the answer here is acl medial collateral ligament and medial meniscus right so the terrible triad of o'donohue or painful triad of the knee three structures are injured mcl medial meniscus and acl and if you recall from my videos i have told you this unhappy triad or painful triad or o'donohue's terrible triad if you remember this triad you will be able to answer four mcqs on the exam the first mcq is what is the most commonly injured ligament around the knee the answer is mcl now among the collateral ligaments which is more commonly injured answer is mcl among the cruciate ligaments which is the more commonly injured acl and among the meniscus which is more commonly injured the medial meniscus right if you remember the triad you will be able to answer four mcqs so those were all the questions that were asked in the ini set exam in the morning and evening session they must have been slightly different but nevertheless we have understood what the topics were now if you have any queries or concerns regarding the things that we have discussed you can find me in the maro facebook group where you can put your query and we'll answer them in few days time or a few hours time you can also find me on instagram and twitter and you can uh, dm me and ask your uh, doubts and i can solve it there as well but please understand the aim of this discussion was not to reach to the right answer but to understand what the examiner is asking and if you've been watching my videos attending my classes or watching my revision videos you will feel confident that everything that has showed up on your exam was already discussed in the class i wish you all the best and i will see you on the other side bye bye